watch him closely. What's the secret, Max? You just gotta find something you love to do and then do it for the rest of your life. I don't want to be a product of my environment. I want my environment to be a product of me. Hello, I'm Eli Price, and you are listening to the Establishing Shot podcast. Uh, this is our first ever episode, and uh, we're excited to to get this going. Um, I have uh, with me today uh, for our first show, uh, Jacob Phillips. Um, Jacob is a good friend of mine. Um, and uh, yeah, we're going to get going on today's show. Um, I'll let him introduce himself in a second. Uh, but we uh, we have an exciting uh, series that we're starting things off with. Um, uh, I'm going to uh, share the vision for this podcast in a minute, um, but I just wanted to share first um, a little bit about myself. I um, I work at a college ministry here in Lafayette, Louisiana, and um, uh, I've done some work uh, at a church as well. Um, and I uh, I really grew uh, to love um, just film and cinema, uh, part-time in my, as a hobby. Uh, and, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's really just become a really huge passion of mine, uh, over the past several years. Um, and, uh, so this is something that I've wanted to do for a long time that I've really, uh, been excited about. And so I'm excited to, to share, uh, just the vision of the podcast um, before we get into the main content. But first, I wanted to let uh, Jacob introduce himself. Uh, so, uh, yeah, Jacob, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so uh, I also uh, do some stuff with uh, the collegiate ministry that Eli works at. That's that's how we met, uh, along with uh, attending the church that, that Eli used to work at as well. Um, and, and really, I, I grew to love film, uh, like growing up. Um, but more on a critical and like analytical side once I got to like college. And so uh, I'm a, I'm about three years out of college now. And so, you know, just being able to to watch movies and, and really sort of analyze why a movie is good or why it is bad versus, you know, growing up, you just watch movies or whatever your parents throw on. And it's, it's just kind of like, oh, that was fun or that was good. And, and now, you know, uh, becoming, I guess, a, a cinephile, uh, being able to to analyze analyze the the art form uh, of things and, and the medium as a whole. So uh, I love movies as well, and and it's just uh, it's been something that that has been a big part of my life for really as long as I can imagine, as long as I can remember. Um, but also just been a big part, uh, especially through college. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, you know, I grew up watching movies too. I remember going to the movies. Um, uh, with my parents and uh i remember uh i don't have a memory of the situation but i have a memory of like my parents talking about uh my grandma showing me jurassic park uh <laughs> before um uh, my parents really thought i was old enough to see it and uh then uh, yeah so that's kind of a movie memory from when i was a kid uh, sure. but yeah um and I, I still love jurassic park to this day so oh, yeah uh but uh yeah you know um, I guess my, my journey just kind of as a film buff, cinephile, whatever you want to call it, uh, really started a few years ago. I was reading a book and uh, it was talking about kind of curating um, your media. And I was kind of thinking about what that would mean for me. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I would I would throw on TV shows and binge TV shows. And um, really, I decided to cut out TV shows completely. And I decided what I'm going to do to to kind of curate my my media intake so that it's something that doesn't control me, but that, you know, I'm in charge of in my life is I'm going to watch just movies, whether I can watch a whole one at a time, break it up, um, you know, while I'm eating lunches each day or whatever it was going to be. And I was going to write uh, something on every movie I watched. So um, that uh, really started back in 2018. 
And um, since then, uh, for a whole year, I wrote on every movie um, I watched at least a, a nice. short paragraph, um, sometimes longer. And so um, I haven't kept that up completely uh, since then, but I would say probably 75 percent of uh, the movies I've watched since then. Um, I, I write uh, some thoughts. I write um, some takeaways. Um, write um sometimes a full full uh full on review um sort of thing and so um it's just really grown uh my love for movies for one and uh two just um I, I feel like my ability to to watch a movie um think about it uh both on a technical side on a thematic side an emotional side um and I just really wanted to do something more with that. And that's mm. um, where the vision for this podcast came. Um, uh, one of my favorite ways to watch movies um, that's kind of grown out of some podcast I've listened to um, is uh, listening through uh, a director's filmography or listening, watching through a director's <laughs> filmography um, and, uh, you know, starting with their first movie and going chronologically through oh, yeah. all their movies. And um, I've just uh, I was like, man, this is one of my favorite ways to watch movies uh, is to do that. And so I've done that with a few directors just on my own time, just uh, just because I, I like it. And I was like, well, why not take this and uh, and put something out there uh, for for other people to do along with me? Um, yeah. And so that's kind of where the vision of this podcast came from is just, man, I, I really think it's, you really get a ton out of it when you say, I want to watch through this director and uh, you start with their first movie and just see their progression of their work um, and the themes um, and uh, techniques that they use throughout their filmography. Um, and it, it helps you grow in love for film in general, for that director, um, and so, yeah, that's, that's my hope for this podcast is, um, if you, uh, take these journeys through these directors with me, uh, that, um, you will grow in, uh, your love for film, that you'll grow in, um, you know, your ability to, to analyze film, to understand it. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of the vision, um, the vision I, I have for this podcast and so um, if you uh, listen to the trailer, uh, then you know that our first director we're going to be covering is Wes Anderson. And so I am super excited. I know Jacob oh, yeah. is too. Um, Wes is one of my uh, one of my favorite directors. Um, you know, I've there's, uh, you know, a good handful um, of directors that I've seen all their movies. Um, and Wes is one of those. Um, and um, I want to say the first Wes Anderson film I ever watched was Moonrise Kingdom, mm. probably not quite a decade ago. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, I don't think I really grasped what was going on uh, in in that Wes Anderson film back then. Um, but then um, I started to watch more like uh, Grand Budapest um, mm -hmm. was coming out and I wanted to see that. Um, then I went back and saw, uh, Royal Tenenbaums and, uh, Fantastic Mr. Fox and, uh, yeah. other movies like that. And over time I, you know, was like, man, I need to see all of this guy's movies. And, um, yeah, I just, uh, I really, um, have grown to love Wes. Um, and something I'm excited about is, uh, a lot of some of his movies I've seen several times, but um, a mm -hmm. lot of them I've only seen once. And so I'm yeah. going to be watching these movies as we go through the series. Um, I haven't sat down and like watched all of them before we started the series, um, like before today. And so each um, before each episode, I'm going to be just watching that movie along with hopefully uh, you guys and the, my guests and the audience. And um, so uh, I'm excited. I, I'm also excited because I haven't seen Moonrise Kingdom since almost a decade ago. Oh, wow. um, I haven't watched it since then. So I'm excited to kind of work my way back and uh, and see that again and see kind of how how I like it um, now that uh, I'm really into Wes Anderson, you know. 
Um, but yeah, yeah uh, would you like to share um, your kind of introduction into Wes Anderson's uh, films, Jacob? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, when I started, you know, we didn't watch like any, for whatever reason, like just growing up, Wes wasn't really on our radar um, in our family. Um, so once I, once like late high school, early college, when I really started getting into films and, and things like that, I would also uh, watch YouTube videos and, and top 10 lists from like Watch Mojo and stuff like that. And Wes sure. Anderson kept coming up over and over again, just because he's, he's a special, you know, filmmaker. And, but for whatever reason, I just, I just didn't watch it. I didn't go out of my way to, to watch any of his movies. I think part of it was like, and I'm kind of glad I didn't watch him back then because I don't, I don't think I would have fully gotten it or grasped it. Um, but the first Wes Anderson movie I ever watched was actually fantastic. Mr. Fox. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, I just, I loved it and I was like, Oh yeah, I'm, I'm in. And so, uh, I watched, uh, Isle of Dogs and then, um, I well, think so you, movies. uh, you went, uh, full in on the stop motion before you moved on to live action, huh? Yeah. Yeah. I just heard, I think, uh, I think Isle of Dogs had been other than maybe the French dispatch, I guess it was like the most recent one. And I was like, man, I just need to go ahead and watch it. Uh, cause I think both of them were on Disney plus. So I've watched, I think I've watched now with watching bottle rock. I've watched seven of his movies and they've all been within the last about year and a half, actually. Wow, okay. Um, so, so they're all pretty fresh. Um, and yeah, I've loved pretty much every single one of them. I mean, there's parts that I didn't like in some, but I mean, for the most part, they're all like super enjoyable. And, and for the most part, I think I have like two or three of them are, uh, I've rated like four and a half out of five. So, right. I mean, he's just, he's a ton of fun and, and just makes a very enjoyable, um, yet deep movie. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that's, that's really cool. Um, I, I feel like a lot of people, um, that are just kind of casual, more casual movie watchers, but still enjoy, you know, watching movies, um, have seen, or at least heard of fantastic Mr. Fox. Yeah. Um, and so, um, I feel like that's, I feel like that's a really good introduction to Wes Anderson. Um, it might be a little bit, uh, too kind of head first into the deep end to go straight into like grand Budapest with, yeah. um, with his style and everything. But, uh, but yeah, um, uh, like my, I think my wife, uh, has seen fantastic Mr. Fox and I think that's the, only, Oh, she's seen Isle of dogs with me. So yeah, she's, she's only seen the stop motion ones as well. And so, yeah. um, and you know, maybe, maybe that works better for some people in that format than the yeah. live action ones. Um, that's, that's great. Um, but yeah, so I just want to give a quick rundown of, of what we're going to be doing, um, through this series. Um, Today, um, for this first episode, uh, we're going to be doing a Wes Anderson overview or um, a Wes Anderson establishing shot, if you will. Um, so uh, what we're going to do is we're going to take this episode and look at who Wes is, kind of his background, how he got into filmmaking, um, and then we're going to kind of do an, uh, you know, this is part of where the name of the show comes from, uh, the establishing shot. We're going to do an establishing shot of his film. We're going to look at, okay, what what sort of things should we be looking for um, as we watch through his filmography? Uh, what sort of techniques does he use uh, that we can kind of look for? What sort of themes um, kind of go through all of his movies uh, that we can be on the lookout for? And uh, hopefully by doing that, um, we'll be able to really grasp um, and be able to en enjoy to a fuller extent uh, his films as we go through. So that's what today's about. We're going to give a little bit of background on him, uh, just some interesting things um, about who he is, and then uh, take some time kind of talking to talking through uh, some of his uh, filming techniques and some uh, thematic elements uh, that we're going to be looking for. So, yeah, I wanted to start it off. And um, and yeah, Jacob, at, you know, at any time, if you uh, hear something interesting through this first part, you know, feel free to just cut me off and um, <laughs> and uh, 
you know, uh, give your two cents. Um, for sure. It, a lot of this is just stuff that I've been uh, researching and so I, I kind of put together some interesting things about West that I think will be, I don't know, will, will be informative for, um, for his films. So, yeah, so uh, Wes was born uh, in Houston, Texas in 1969. And um, he, uh, that's where he grew up. So um, all the way through high school, college, uh, and even a little after college, he uh, was in Texas. Um, he's a, a Texas boy. You wouldn't think that. No, <laughs> um, not at all. Uh, but yeah, he's he's a, a Texas boy, born and raised. Um, and so, um, one of the things uh, that kind of stood out um, from his childhood um, is, uh, is it, he uh, he took some time when he was a kid um, to record. At, you know, make a few movies. Um, mm -hmm. He, uh, he had a, his dad had a super eight camera um, that he let him use. And uh, yeah, he, he recorded some movies. I think I read that his first ever movie he made was about, it was one little reel, 180 seconds. Um, and it was about some kids skateboarding. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, he, he, he kind of said in one interview I was reading that uh, he made some kind of Indiana Jones type with uh, some like little sets and costumes that him and his friends made. And uh, so, yeah, he, um, uh, you know, he loved Indiana Jones and wanted to make his own. So yeah, he, from a young age, you know, he was, he was making movies. Um, and um, uh, I think one of the, one of the funny things is um, that he was talking about, cause uh, the interviewer asked if he still had those and, he doesn't, he, um, his, the camera and the, all the, the case that all the film reels were in were stolen out of his car. Oh. Uh, and he, he said, uh, when he was older, he said he went to like all the pawn shops around town and, uh, he just couldn't find them. So he doesn't have Dang. any of that stuff anymore. Yeah. Oh. Uh, I was like, someone out there has something probably pretty valuable, right? Now. Yeah. For real. <laughs> and they probably have no clue. Um, uh, yeah, I just thought that was really funny. And uh, he was like, you know, devastating in the moment. But uh, he mm -hmm. kind of acted like, ah, no big deal now. You know, they weren't very good yeah. anyway. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, um, one of the things that stood out about his childhood um, that Wes himself has uh, has pointed out in interviews and, and whatnot is that um, his uh, his parents were uh, divorced when he was pretty young. Um, and, um, Wes has, uh, been recorded as saying that, you know, that was the kind of most crucial defining mm -hmm. event for him and his brothers in his childhood. And, um, you know, I think that's pretty, that's going to be pretty informative for, um, his films, uh, thematically, especially as we, we watch through them. Um, you know, uh, it's something that, um, was just very influential in his life. Um, yeah. a, a traumatic event. It was tough. Um, we'll talk a little bit that about that when we get to his, his filmmaking kind of philosophy, but yeah, um, that was something that stood out. Uh, and then kind of moving on into his older age, um, you know, he, he obviously wanted to direct movies when he was young. And then, um, mm -hmm. in high school, he said he kind of switched and he was like, I'm going to be a writer. And, um, yeah. Um, but he still, even in high school, um, he went to, uh, St. John's private, uh, prep in, in, there in Houston. And, um, he, uh, he actually wrote and, uh, directed plays at his high school, yeah. uh, there at St. John's. And so even though, even when he switched in high school to be wanting to be a writer, he was still writing movies and, and directing, well, not movies, but plays and directing yeah. them. Um, so man, it's just, obviously this is in his DNA, you know, mm -hmm. he, he was born to do this. And so, um, it just came out of him no matter where he was in life. Um, but yeah, so he, uh, when he went to college, he kind of, uh, switched back, um, to wanting to be a director. And a lot of that was, um, it kind of came out of his, uh, kind of diving into film history and whatnot. Mm -hmm. He, um, he went to the university of Texas in Austin and, um, he, he's talked about in interviews how, 
uh, they had several libraries there at UT and um, he would go to these these movie sections. All of them had a movie section and um, they would have all these books um, on films. So there would be, uh, you know, book, uh, books about um, uh, Fellini and uh, and uh, Gerard and all these. Uh, he said he said it was almost as if like they collected all these books on movies and then it, they stopped. And so like. <laughs> all the books they had were on like these uh 50s and 60s uh european films um like in the french new wave and um all this all this sort of stuff but then like they didn't have like anything past that uh you know i thought that was that was kind of funny um oh yeah so he yeah so he he starts uh looking at all these movies um kind of on these guys and uh what ends up happening is um, he just he's like, well, I'm reading these books. Let's watch these movies. And so, um, yeah, he's he's reading these books. He's watching these movies, um, uh, kind of some of the guys that he he's mentioned, um, uh, Fellini, uh, Ingmar Bergman, uh, Truffaut. Um, uh, yeah, a lot, just a lot of 60s European films. Yeah. Um, you know, and he said they had some uh, some books like on Scorsese and Francis Ford Coppola, mm -hmm. um, John Ford, but but yeah, a lot of um, a lot of it was was that that yeah that sixties European film, and so he's watching these, and um, he took um, he took a playwriting class, um, and he uh, he he actually majored in philosophy um, there at UT. Um, and, and graduated. And, uh, yeah, so he, you know, he grew this love for film kind of just by like diving headfirst into these books and watching through all these movies. Um, and, um, yeah, so it, it's funny, uh, you can kind of see those, those influences on his mm -hmm. film, um, of those kind of sixties, fifties and sixties European movies. Um, and, um, yeah. It, so you, you know, you, you go through his life journey. He's a kid. Um, he's a kid that, you know, is watching movies with his family. That's making movies on a super eight camera. Um, mm -hmm. he even talked about, um, when, uh, when in an interview, you know, a kind of question like, you know, when did you first know you wanted to be a director or that was even something that was possible, uh, he talked about having these Betamax tapes of mm -hmm. uh, Alfred Hitchcock movies like Rope and Rear, Win Rear Window. And um, he said what the reason that he realized, oh, this is something that I can do with my life is on the, I guess, the artwork on the front, kind of the little movie poster on the front. Um, it would the big name would be Alfred Hitchcock. And so he said as a kid that really like struck him um, because most movies, you know, you'll see the actors or actresses yeah. kind of highlighted. Um, but for Hitchcock movies, it wasn't the um, the star wasn't the people in front of the camera. The star mm -hmm. was the person behind the camera. And um, I just thought that was really a really cool thought of like as a kid seeing that and thinking like, oh, this is something that. I can do with my life is be yeah. a person behind a camera making movies. And so, you know, starting with that all the way through, you know, just diving into these films in college, um, he just, you know, he grew a love for movies. And um, he, um, when he was at UT, uh, actually he is when he met Owen Wilson. Um, uh, he was, uh, actually in a, a playwriting class with Owen Wilson. Um, but they didn't talk to each other then. Uh, <laughs> I, I thought that was funny. Um, he said that he would kind of be in one corner of the room being uh, seclusive over there and Owen would be in the other, uh, being seclusive on his side. And, um, hmm. and yeah, they didn't even talk to each other. They ran into each other, uh, the next semester and, uh, -huh. uh and kind of hit it off and, uh, kind of, realized that he, they both loved film and yeah. both had kind of thought about like, Hey, what, maybe we can make a film. And so, yeah, after, um, 
after he uh he graduated um owen kind of like he didn't graduate but he just was like i'm done i'm done with college <laughs> and so um owen convinced him to come back to dallas and um uh with him and uh he was uh working for um andrew um owen's older brother mm-hmm. um and so he was working for him they were actually all living in uh this little apartment um i think wes said uh, it was technically uh, a three room apartment but only one actual bedroom in the apartment and so there was times where there was like four of them between like uh wes and owen and andrew and um and uh bob um who is in their first film model rocket they're all just like living in this sleeping in the same room together in this apartment um and um yeah so they're in this apartment they're like let's let's make a movie it's something we want to do um they actually wrote um the a feature like they wrote a, a script for a feature film and they were like well we you know we got to record it so they they kind of scrapped together a few thousand dollars um i think i think that most of it came like from their parents yeah yeah that's and, what i read that it was it, right. a lot of it was from the the wilson's uh parents right so uh yeah they kind of scrapped together a few thousand and um they were able to shoot uh eight minutes um uh eight minute black and white uh film and uh actually it's funny um you know a lot of uh a lot of times what happens with um these filmmakers as they're getting started they'll make um a short that's kind of like a concept yeah um you know it's it's kind of like let, let's make this short and we're going to take it to some people and it's going to be to show them hey this is what the feature could be like and yeah. so they'll show the short they'll be like yeah we like it we're going to give you more money and so you can kind of um start from scratch to make the feature um but actually um they didn't have that vision at all they were like we we have our script we're going to just start shooting scenes and so yeah. the the original bottle rocket short um that that came out um they um they actually from one of their mentors um kit uh kit carson who was also like a a writer director um Mm -hmm. in his own right he kind of mentored them he uh he was able to scrounge together a little bit more money for them and they extended it to a 13 minute short from eight uh so what they were doing was actually they were like let's shoot some scenes and they just shot scenes until they ran out of money and um you know kit convinced them like hey let's he had some connections with sundance film festival and convinced them to you know submit it it got accepted as a short but they never saw it as a short they just saw it as here's some scenes from the full movie we want to (laughs) make yeah it's kind (laughs) of like they kind of did like a pilot essentially for a for a movie (laughs) yeah 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 that's a good way to think of it It, um it's not like a a concept of the film where you kind of see oh this is you know the plot what the plot will be like no it's just like some scenes uh yeah. from, from the movie now it it ended up being like one of the first scenes um in the movie uh which makes sense like they were like yeah. let's start shooting from the beginning um but yeah so um so yeah they uh they got it accepted at um at sundance it, it did fine um and then they were just kind of like okay where do we go from here <laughs> um and so i think the progression was um so Kit Carson, who was kind of their um, their mentor early on, he got it to um, a producer named uh, Barbara Boyle, and um, yeah, Bar- uh, he got it to Barbara Boyle. Barbara Boyle um, knew Polly Platt. Uh, Polly Platt did uh, the Last Picture Show, mm. um, and she was a, a major producer um, at the time. Polly Platt knew uh, James L. Brooks, um, who, um, if you don't know who James L. Brooks is, he's kind of, um, he's kind of, he's done some stuff that you would recognize, but he's also done a lot of like mentoring and, yeah. and, uh, and investing in, and in people coming up. But, uh, but yeah, he did the, the Mary Tyler Moore show. Um, and then he directed movies like Terms of Endearment, Broadcast mm-hmm. News. Um, so yeah, Jim, uh, Jim Brooks got, got it from so 
Kit Carson, the Purple Boyle, the Polly Platt, and Polly Platt liked it enough that she was, took it to Jim and she was like, you got to make this. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, Jim has, uh, Jim Brooks has mentored and kind of been the guy behind people like uh, Matt, um, uh, I have trouble with his last name, Matt Groening, who mm-hmm. made The Simpsons, yeah. uh, Danny DeVito, uh, Steve Cloves, uh, Cameron Crowe that made Say Anything. Those are some of like Jim uh, Brooks's protégés. And so, you, you know, you wouldn't think like you get this kind of weird, strange movie from these guys living in an apartment together in Dallas. Yeah. Um, and uh, Jim's like, yeah, I want to make this. Uh, but he did. Um, uh, yeah, he, he saw it. Uh, Polly was and Polly Platt actually um, was a major proponent in like, Jim, we've got to get you down there to these guys to make this movie. Yeah. So Jim goes, uh, she convinces him. He goes to Dallas, he meets them at their little, uh, their little kind of, uh, messy apartment. And, um, they, uh, they kind of get a, um, little room, uh, at a hotel, a uh, little conference room. And, um, Jim's like, have y'all read it? Have y'all read the script? And they are like, no, it had never occurred to them to like actually read through the whole script. And, uh, I think I read somewhere that the original script was 225 pages, which, yeah. Uh, in general, I think, um, just like, you know, it's, it's probably give or take, but, uh, in general that comes out to about like a four hour movie. And yeah. So, uh, no, it's super long. Yeah. And so like, she, I think for, just for reference, like, uh, I was listening to a podcast on, uh, Boogie Nights from Paul Thomas Anderson yeah. and the original script for that one was 185 minutes, which if you've ever seen it, that's a really long movie that's right. almost three hours long. So like 185 page script is like really long so then like going to 225 is like yeah. crazy right yeah i mean you need an intermission for sure in that <laughs> movie um but uh jim uh in interviews jim uh you can kind of see like the smirk on his face he's talking about you know they read it and they kept reading and they kept reading and uh you know we got hungry and then we ran out of water <laughs> and everyone was parched and uh he said, but, you know, eventually we got through the movie and, um, yeah, it's, it was too long. You know, he said he didn't really have to say anything. He just kind of looked around and everyone kind of knew what needed to happen. And, uh, um, yeah. uh, so he's, he's leaving and, um, you know, all the guys have kind of said in different interviews, you know, Wes ran across the street. He was like, wait, ran across the street. And, um, and he actually said, uh, he said, to Jim Brooks, something to the effect of, so are you going to make our movie or do we have a deal or something like that? And Jim's like, well, you know, he starts to go into this thing and Wes like actually uh, supposedly like kind of interrupts him and is like, but do we have a deal? <laughs> and um, Jim's like, well, I don't know, man, let's, let's, let's see what happens. And so they ended up moving them out to Hollywood. Oh, wow. um, to do a rewrite of the script. Um, so yeah, um, it's just funny. Um, these, these guys just scrapping together, uh, a short, um, in, uh, in Dallas, um, get Jim Brooks somehow to come to the little apartment, read through their script with them and then move them out to Hollywood, uh, to make this film. And that's where bottle rocket came from their first film. Yeah. And um, it's really incredible. Um, it's really incredible to look at, um, you know, this, you know, we'll talk about Bottle Rocket in, in much more detail at a later date. But, um, yeah, it, it's just really incredible to see these guys. They were like, we really want to do this. And they yeah. they did it um, and they did it their way. Uh, yeah. And um, that just really um, stood out to me as I was, as I was learning about, um, you know, how he got started. And so, um, yeah, it, it's, it's just, um, I don't know. It, it's a kind of a testament and we'll, we'll get into this. Um, it's kind of a testament to just having a vision and knowing something that you want to do and, and yeah. love doing and enjoy and just sticking with it. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I don't know. Was there anything from, from kind of that, that bio that stood out to you? Yeah. I just think that like, 
you know, he, uh, he just grew up like, and, and as we'll talk about it in, in later detail, but like, you know, he really is so, I think he's a very cerebral guy, obviously. And he mm -hmm. just kind of took everything from his life and just puts it into his movies. Um, so it's really it, like knowing that aspect of it, uh, means that he had probably a pretty interesting upbringing and, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> high school life and college life, you know? Um, but I, I just love like the, the stories of, of people, uh, you know, in that are now major people in Hollywood, like having these sort of just random, like friendships and upbringings that, that get them to where they're at now, you know? So like Owen Wilson, who had like no formal acting, uh, you know, uh, schooling or anything like that, right. you know? And, yeah. None of them did. <laughs> yeah. And so like, they, they just kind of banded together, like you said, and, and lived together. Uh, very similar to, you know, Matt Damon and Ben Affleck uh, in Boston mm -hmm. back in their days. So I, I just love stories like that. And and I think friendship is obviously one of the big things that runs throughout his movies. And so you can see that like through his life, like that's been a, a, a very important part. So, yeah, it's just it's just really cool to see success stories like that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, just real quick, um, I just wanted to note. Um, just a few other random things, you know, um, he, uh, Wes over the years, he, he hasn't really got a ton of, um, uh, I guess interest from like the Academy as far as awards mm -hmm. go and stuff like that. Um, uh, the only thing I, th you know, I, th I think he won, um, he definitely was nominated for a lot of things, starting with Royal Tenenbaums. He got mm -hmm. like original screenplay was his first nomination. Uh, he didn't win that. He was nominated for animated feature for Mr. Fox. Didn't win that. Um, original screenplay again for Moonrise Kingdom. Didn't win that. And uh, really, it wasn't until Grand Budapest, I think, that he started winning stuff. Mm -hmm. um, had, did you see... Um, did you happen to 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 see if he won anything at the Academy for Grand Budapest? I know he won a BAFTA. Um, yeah, for he won. Screenplay. Um, he won BAFTA and he won uh, the Golden Globe for musical comedy. Uh, but he actually okay. didn't. He he was nominated for best director and best picture um, right, by the Academy right. in twenty fourteen, but but didn't actually win it. Yeah, I think original screenplay too for at the Academy. Yeah, I think Grand Budapest got that too. Um, Isle of Dogs also, um, I think was animated featured and didn't mm -hmm. win. Um, I think I was, re I remember watching and being really disappointed. Uh, yeah. I loved, I loved it, um, that year, but, uh, it's a yeah, really good uh, year, by the way, for, uh, for the Academy for 2014. That sure, was yeah. mm -hmm. Birdman, Grand Budapest, Imitation Game, Selma, Whiplash, yeah. some really good yeah. ones in there. Mm -hmm, for sure. Um, but yeah, so he, he, you know, he's gotten some, um, he's won some awards with like, uh, some critics associations and stuff yeah. like that, but really hasn't won a whole lot of big stuff. Um, really just that one BAFTA win for screenplay for Grand Budapest. Um, so, uh, yeah. And then, um, yeah, I wanted to note, um, you know, I talked about his, um, his Hitchcock tapes, uh, was a yeah. big influence on him. Uh, just kind of some of his in inspirations. And, and this is one thing that you'll notice with, um, with Wes, uh, he, a lot of times when people kind of are influenced by something, they'll like do something exactly the same, but he kind of like, he does something and you and you're kind of like, man, that looks familiar. Mm -hmm. And, um, it's, it's just, he does a little something different with it, yeah. uh, which I think is cool. But Hitchcock, uh, Scorsese, um, he's been, he's said before that when he started making movies, uh, Scorsese was one of his favorites. Um, you know, I talked about him making kind of, uh, Indiana Jones stuff when he was little, he loved Raiders. Yeah. Um, like who didn't, who didn't as a, if they were a kid right. when that, you know, came out, um, Truffaut was, um, he watched, uh, I remember in an interview, he said he watched the 400 blows, uh, by Truffaut. Mm who was, uh, you know, part of the kind of French new wave. And, um, that was a, that was probably one of his biggest, like, okay, I want to make movies kind of moments. Uh, that was when he was at UT. Um, 
but yeah, a lot of those same guys that I've already mentioned that he was reading, um, and, uh, like Kurosawa, um, mm-hmm. was a big one for him. And you kind of see that in Isle of Dogs. He kind of, yeah. um, he kind of does a little bit of, the, uh, Kurosawa influence there, but, um, but yeah, uh, his filmmaking philosophy, I, I know you had some, um, some notes for, for this kind of section, um, uh, what are some things that kind of stood out as you were looking at, okay, what is, what does Wes think about when he's making movies? Yeah. Um, so he has this quote um, and he said that he doesn't mind making movies that are linked together, but um, he wouldn't love to have someone say, that's just, that's just like something you did before. So like yeah. he, he wants to be distinct, but also um, he, he, he also just wants to do what he likes. So like he's kind of fine with things looking similarly just because that's what he likes. But I think he wants like the product overall to be different. I think they are for the most part. Mm -hmm. Um, And then, you know, I think that like, obviously he has an unusual sense of humor. Um, He's very, you know, like you you have written down, he's precise. Um, Mm -hmm. And uh, this was something I, I, I heard in an interview with his cinematographer uh, he said, he said before Wes even comes in, he makes sure that the cinematographer, uh, and his assistants, like make sure that the camera is quite literally in the dead center of, of wherever they're yeah. shooting. Um, because he's so meticulous with, with being symmetrical and everything like that, which I thought right. is, is pretty cool. Yeah. That was, uh, Robert Yeoman, uh, yeah. his, his, uh, DP, um, or cinematographer, uh, for pretty much all of his live action stuff. Um, yeah. Uh, he has uh, someone else for the the stop motion, but um, mm-hmm. but yeah, yeah. He in that interview, he said he said like Wes will come in, and um, the first thing he'll say is, "Are we uh, are we centered on that wall?" And yeah, like, yep, yeah, we got it, we got it <laughs> done for you. We know, you know, we know what you like. Um, so and uh, and actually, Robert Yeomans um, uh, <clears throat> has a big influence, uh, and when we start talking about his technique, you know. Um, Wes has the vision for it, but, uh, Yeoman is actually, um, you know, he, he works so well with Wes because he shares mm-hmm. a lot of his vision of what to do. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah. Um, yeah. One of the things that stood out to me, um, that, uh, Wes has kind of talked about is just write what, you know, you know, mm-hmm. um, and, uh, that's something, you know, when you think about, his childhood and how one of the critical events was just like the traumatic experience with him and his brothers of having your parents separate, um, you know, and how you see that kind of brokenness in families kind of, uh, as a thread through all of his movies. And it's because he, he knows it. And, uh, that's something that he believes you should do with your art. You make what you know. Um, And I think that's important. I think sometimes directors and filmmakers can get a little, um, a little, uh, big headed and start making stuff. That's a little out of what they actually know. Yeah. A lot of times it can come off as like very, like, I don't know, um, appropriating of maybe other cultures or ideas or, or even just like come off as just, um, I don't know, pompous, you know? Yeah. Um, and so that's or, something I appreciate. What were yeah, you going to say? They, they can get bogged down too with trying to like over explain something because they've put in so much time and effort into like researching whatever it is sure. that like the movie can get bogged down with, with stuff like that. So, yeah. yeah, I think that's, that, that would be like a lot of people's complaints with, uh, Christopher Nolan movies. Yeah. Like he's, he's spent so much time <laughs> studying like space that he wants to explain it to you in his movie. (laughs) Um, and that doesn't bother me a whole lot, but I know some people, uh, really, um, hate that about Chris Nolan movies. Uh, but yeah, you don't, you're not going to find that in Wes, his, even his dialogue with his characters, you know, it's very like cut and dry. Like they say exactly what they're thinking or feeling, um, uh, a lot of the times. And so, Right. What, you know, um, uh, you build a world for your characters to live in. And and I think that's, that's something that he does really well. Um, and I'm going to get, I'm going to get into that a little bit later on. Um, but yeah, um, 
you know, um, I'm going to kind of move through here. Uh, one of the things um, he talked about is just finding a spark, you know, mm-hmm. Um, I don't know who might be listening out there, but, uh, you know, if you're an artist or of, of some sort, um, find something that, you know, just sparks your imagination, sparks your interest. Um, you know, that's what this podcast is for me. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, I just have grown to love be passionate about, um, films and watching through directors. And I was like, man, I'm going to make something, um, why not? Um, and then, you know, along with that is just the idea of just go shoot, just yeah. do it. Um, that's what they did with bottle rocket. You know, I talked yeah. about, they're like, we wrote this script, let's go do it. Let's start making it. Um, you know, and now here he is a very accomplished, uh, director, but very well respected. And so, um, you know, that's, um, kind of, um, a word of advice, uh, that kind of Wes has had, um, I guess, indirectly for people through interviews is just, Hey, you know, this is my story. You you can see, just, just go do it. Um, you know, maybe it'll flop, maybe it'll fail, but, um, but just go do it. Um, yeah. Uh, so, um, let's get, um, let's move on to kind of, we're going to move through this pretty quickly. We're, uh, we're going on a while here now. Um, but let's look at some of Wes's techniques. Um, uh, so, uh, we probably won't hit on everything, but the good thing is we're going to be watching through all his movies. And so, um, we're going to be able to talk about these things as we go through. Um, one of the things, uh, one of the first things in his kind of filmmaking technique, um, is, uh, more on the writing side would be, Uh, that uh, one thing that I kind of see in his movies is that they're pretty low in plot, meaning there's mm-hmm. not like a plot driving the movies. Um, but it's very like, it has a very high view of his characters. Um, he's more interested in, okay, what are these characters doing and how are they relating to each other? than like, what's the story being told? Yeah. Um, uh, so that's, that's one thing, um, that I, I wanted to highlight because I, as we watch these movies, I feel like that's, I feel like a lot of people have trouble with his movies because, you know, there's not really like a story being told per se Mm. in the traditional sense of a, of a plot. Um, so that's one thing that we can look for. Um, what are, what are some of the kind of technique things that stand out to you? Yeah. When, when talking about characters, uh, he, he said before that he feels that any one of his characters can walk out of any of the movies and walk into another one of his movies and be at home there, um, which I think is very interesting and, and also just plays into the fact of one, like the plot isn't always as important to him, but also I think, you know, kind of what I mentioned earlier, how he feels that like all of his characters are are people um, that he's known or a combination of people that he's known. And so, you know, they're all part of his life. He's, he's making what he knows. So of course they would all, you know, be able to interact with each other um and and it just makes sense all of that being there um the symmetry is obviously like you know i think that's kind of what he's sort of known for um on on a basic level just how you know perfectly symmetrical every shot seems to be um Mm -hmm. and everything like that which i i really like uh there's some people that obviously they don't like it um just because it's really different from basically every other filmmaker you know yeah um but but I really like it. I think it's unique, you know, how he sort of shoots conversations, um, sort of just, you know, a, a back and forth, you know, image flipped, uh, which, which I think is just, is really fun. Um, yeah. Yeah. And kind of on that, um, it, it's funny because you, you talked about characters and then went straight into, uh, kind of that, that head on symmetry, uh, yeah. uh, thing. And that's one of the things, um, it, with his technique is um he does these when he when he's like cutting back and forth um between characters and dialogue um instead of most of the time you get kind of offset shots mm-hmm. um um when you cut back and forth in dialogue and he does him and uh in his dp robert yeoman that we talked about uh they like to do these straight on shots so right you're looking directly kind of like you know we're looking at each other straight on right yeah now. exactly over this uh, uh video and um 
and you get that back and forth cut. And what that does is, um, it, uh, it highlights, um, the character you're, you're, uh, you know, even sometimes with the editing, you know, you'll be, there'll be people on the phone. It'll go back and forth between their two sets where they are. And, uh, one of the thing, you know, because he's so into the production design, you know, the costumes and the sets, um, those end up really highlighting who the character is. Um, so like in the Royal Tenenbaums, they're having a conversation over the phone, um, a few of the siblings and you're going from these completely different like sets, um, that each of the characters are in, but the set and the costumes of the characters kind of show who the characters are. Yeah. Um, and, and highlights and emphasizes that, which, uh, which I think is really cool. Um, and the symmetry too, um, it really, uh, it, it's not just in the, the shots, like the, the still frames, but it's in the editing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you'll get a lot of cuts in dialogue where, um, you know, you'll cut to one character talking and they'll be on the right side of the screen. Then you'll cut to the other character and they'll be on the left side of the screen. Mm-hmm. Um, and you kind of get that in the editing, um, too. Um, and man, it, the editing in, in his movies are really incredible. Um, yeah. uh, like you get these rhythmic patterns, um, uh, that happen. Like you'll, you'll even have scenes where things are happening, like these editing cuts and stuff are happening to the rhythm of like the score. Mm -hmm. Um, or you'll get this pattern, like in the grand Budapest when they're like calling from hotel to hotel, Yeah, you'll get this pattern of like, calling the bellhop over the bellhop gets on the phone. He says kind of the same things and then he hangs up and goes to do something. And then you'll cut to the other, the next one. And it's like this pattern. And, uh, man, that's one of the things that's, that stood out to me. And, um, and looking into this is just like, man, the editing is, is just incredible. There's so much going on. That's so purposeful. Yeah. Um, And everything's so equally timed to whenever he does like those rhythmic things, which is, which is really cool. Yeah. Yeah. And he'll do these. um, He he's one of those directors that really like he knows what he wants. And so he doesn't do like all these different shots where you have to like edit together all these. Oh, we need to see what works together. He kind of has a a good vision. And so um, uh, I think uh, Polly Platt, one of the producers that we were talking about of Bottle Rocket, she was talking about um, there's a scene where uh, Dignan, one of the main characters, Owen Wilson, is looking down and, and Bob has left with the car and she's like, man, I really tried to convince Wes that we need a shot down, you know, seeing the empty uh, spot, but he just wouldn't shoot it. He was like, no, I'm not, I'm not even going to shoot that. Cause I don't want that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So he just knows what he wants. And so he really doesn't do like a ton of different shots. He, he does these like take like two takes edits, um, yeah. which really like keeps you focused on the characters. Um, you're not like getting whiplash, you know, looking around uh, the scene. Um, so I, I really appreciate that about the editing. And then he'll have these moments too. One of the things um, that I love is he'll have these moments of just like most of the movie, like we said, just like these two shot edits where you're getting, you know, you're kind of staying within these two shots in the scene. But then you'll get these moments where like something fr- frantic is happening, like a chase yeah. or a fight between some characters or something and there'll be these really aggressive like edits of like cut 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 a yeah. lot is happening very frantic and then all of a sudden you'll boom pause and you'll be on the still frame and it's really um like it can do two things it one of the things it does is it's really comedic like yeah. to uh to have this thing going on and then you kind of cut to a still frame you like you pan to a still frame of these people like watching and it's just pauses for a second and it's mm. funny like it's a funny it's a, it's editing that is comedic um yeah. which is really incredible that like it's not just like the writing that makes it funny it's the way you edit it that makes it funny um and two uh, another thing it does is it it can create like an emotional inertia so yeah. like you with the characters through through the way that they're cutting together these different frames like you're building up this emotion like there's a lot going on oh my gosh like maybe it's like um adrenaline or maybe it's like anger and then all of a sudden like you stop and mm-hmm. you're like left with this like inertia of emotion that like you now you have to sit with it 
Yeah. Um, uh, and along with ponder the characters. it and think about it and, and right, get that time right. to reflect on it, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And so, um, man, the editing, I, I look forward to talking about kind of these different w- things that he's done with that. Um, but yeah, just uh, real quick, um, you know, we all know uh, the colors, Yeah, uh, the colors in his movies, they create moods and tones. Um, as we get into each individual movie, we can talk about, you know, the, the costumes, um, you know, a lot of times a character will be connected to a color. Yeah. Um, you think about Gustav H and in, in Grand mm-hmm. Budapest, he's, he's purple, like, mm-hmm. um, yeah. And so, um, you know, they, um, one of the things that, uh, that I saw pointed out somewhere is that you, you have these like bright kind of storybook sets and colors Mm -hmm. and, um, and then you have these dark themes and we'll get into that in a minute set on top of it. And, um, it really, uh, it really forces you as a viewer to reconcile those two things. There's this like bright, beautiful world full of wonder but yet there's these like dark things happening in it um, yeah. and it forces you to kind of reconcile that darkness and light um that kind of like depression and cynicism mm-hmm. with like hope and um and so that's one of the things that, that i think um hope and, and even humor you know how can this be both depressing yeah. and humorous at the same time and it's not just in what's happening it's in like the colors, um, too, in the, the production design. Um, Yeah. So, yeah. Um, the, the only other thing that I wanted to highlight is just the music. Um, you know, Wes, he has a very, uh, distinctive kind of, he has a very distinctive, uh, like, I guess scores and muse the way he uses music. He, um, he's, uh, I think that's one of the big Scorsese influences is the needle drop. Oh yeah, man. Uh, Scorsese knows how to throw that needle drop and throw that pop song in Definitely. to fit just right. And Wes, man, he's so good at it. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we've watched bottle rocket, both of us recently. And man, there's some moments where like that needle drops and you're just like, yes, this is the yeah. perfect song for this moment. Yeah. Um, but also like his scores, those kind of folksy, uh, like Euro rock, um, sound like, uh, scores are just like, they just fit. Um, yeah, and it's definitely. sort of like the colors, it kind of, it forces you to reconcile like what you see happening on screen with this kind of whimsical sound that you yeah. have going along behind it. Uh, yeah. Was there anything else you wanted to, to point out in, in that regard for his technique? Yeah. It's just, you know, like you said with the colors, like everything, and we'll talk more about it with the themes, but everything is just typically like very fantastical. Um, oh, yeah. And that comes out, you know, with and, and I think like the way that the movies are shot and the way that the production and set design and colors and all that, like it's not, I guess in a, it's not like realistic, quote unquote, you right. know, like you're you're literally just kind of looking in the, the fantasies of, of the things that he wants to talk about and and put uh, put on screen. And so, you know, once you I think once you understand that and you're not like. Cause there's, there's certain times where you watch a movie and you're like a character would never do something like that, you know? Right. But like, this is, this is literally just what he wants you to see. This is what he likes. This is what he's, he's wanting to do here. And, and so once you get that and grasp onto that, I think that it really unlocks a lot of his movies and you can just sort of enjoy it just cause it's like, yeah, this is like what Wes Anderson is, is enjoying as well. You know? Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, I'm going to touch on that in just a minute. Uh, I think there's really something even more profound going on with that. Yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that. But um, uh, real quick, these themes, uh, mm-hmm. what, you know, you talked about people will, will, will kind of say, like, you've made that before. You know, you've done that before. Um, and I think that's um, a lot of that has to do with um, with, yeah, his technique, but also like his themes um, and really like all of his movies are like essentially like when you break it down to its very core, I feel like his movies are about flawed characters and flawed Mm -hmm. relationships. And what do you do with it? Like, what do you do when you have one flawed person that is, uh, you know, in a family with other flawed people 
and yeah. they they let all of their you know all of their flaws out yeah. at each other you know um you know it's it's these misfits that like don't know where they are in life or maybe they do uh but they're just like terrible at at, at yeah. it or they're terrible at relating to other people and um yeah it's like he drops them into this world this beautiful whimsical you know uh storybook world and he's like mm -hmm. have you know wreak havoc on this world um <laughs> all these flawed characters uh yeah, yeah so I, I think that's what it really boils down to his movies you know we talked about they're not so much interested in plot as they are interested in the characters and um yeah. and if there's like one thread that runs through all of his movies i think it's that it's these it's this idea of what happens when flawed people interact with flawed people you yeah. know um yeah what what was there are there any like major themes that you wanted to point out that you've seen i think there's really like you know we've talked a a decent bit about it because i think like the technique and the theme kind of they go together yeah, yeah, a lot for sure um but there was something that he said in an interview once and like it didn't quite like I didn't, I didn't really notice it like as far as like a common thread throughout his movies, but um, he, he mentions that there's always a shift in his movies. Like there's mm -hmm. always something serious that happens typically in his yeah. movies that kind of not necessarily halts it, but like, like you kind of said, like brings about like the, the dark things that happen in this world. So like, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's, there's the moment uh, in Royal Tenenbaums, there's, um, the, mm. the children's, uh, death scene and the Darjeeling limited. Um, yeah. there's, there's a number of examples, um, where there's just like, man, something like hits that's like not funny at all. Like, and right. you can't really find any humor in it. Um, mm. but yeah, it's just, it's interesting that he's able to, to make movies that are so whimsical, like you say, like you said, and, and so entertaining, but also that are dealing with such deep and, and really sometimes depressing uh you know ideas behind it yeah yeah and that's something you know that's also a thread is you know his movies like really thematically are are pretty dark um, yeah he deals with i mean he deals with a lot of stuff he 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 like he doesn't shy away from anything nothing is like you you have this kind of storybook uh childlike perspective that's going yeah. on in his movies um but it's kind of at the same time, you know, it's, he's dealing with things like mental illness and depression mm -hmm. and suicide and tra yeah. like childhood trauma. And it's not like, it's not like something that like you kind of have to interpret. It's like, no, yeah. it's right there in your face. Um, and, um, yeah, it, it, he kind of, I think he deals with this theme, um, along those lines of, man, we're never really done growing up. Yeah. You know, a lot of his characters, what you'll see is, um, it's funny, you'll see this kind of flip where children kind of act like adults yeah. and the adults kind of act like children. Um, and it's kind of like a funny way of emphasizing like, you know, the adults need to grow up. Like we're, we need to grow up too, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, and And that's what ends up happening a lot of his movies is like, you know, these characters who are adults but acting like children in some ways like have to have something happen where you know they really um i don't know have to come to terms with who they are or what they've done yeah. um sort of thing so yeah it's um and it's again it's that idea of uh that we talked about in his technique uh where you have like humor and hope uh mm -hmm. juxtaposed with darkness and cynicism um and um yeah one of the things i saw too that i thought was cool about his just kind of a thread is it seems like all of his movies end um to some degree in one way or another with like these flawed characters that we talked about like kind of reconciling in some mm -hmm. way yeah. um whether it's like through forgiveness or just kind of like acceptance of some sort yeah um which i, I think is something that you know we can start like kind of look for as we watch through these movies. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. The, the only other thing that kind of stood out to me that I saw someone mention 
um, in an article or interview um, was that like his characters are walking contradictions. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I loved that. Um, I was like, man, I relate to that. <laughs> oh <laughs> like, yeah. I'm a walking contradiction for sure. Yeah. And, um, and I think that's, um, uh, you know, kind of going back to the, the idea of like his interest in characters, you know, that's why you can have, I don't know. He, he pulls off kind of the impossible in his movies. Um, and I think that's why like, guys like um, uh, Martin Scorsese and Jim Brooks um, and guys like that have kind of said, you know, early on in Wes's career, they said, man, he has a unique voice. Yeah. He's not just like going to have a good career. He, but he has a unique voice. He's bringing a new voice yeah. uh, to cinema. And I think, um, you know, you can talk about a lot of different ways he does that. But I think one of the main ways is um, his, his, his interest in the characters, you know, mm -hmm. he, that's why you can have this really whimsical, humorous, like storybook world and somehow like have these very direct, um, interactions with darkness. And it doesn't feel, um, you know, that shouldn't work. Right. Right. Yeah. That should, that should be like, it should be like two cars in a collision, like, and it's just a wreck, but yeah, somehow it works and i think the reason is because of his deep passion and care about who these people are yeah. you know you mentioned he all of his characters are like kind of combinations of himself and his friends and people he's known in his life and um i think that really shows up because for me at least you know obviously not everyone's going to connect with these movies but mm -hmm. for me at least i connect with them because I look at these people and I'm like, these are real people. Yeah. Um, they might be saying like really funny things and very dry humor. <laughs> and like, uh, they're like set against this, uh, like weird, strange world that he's created to put them yeah. in. But like when something serious happens, it's like, I actually care, you know? Yeah. I'm like, man, I, I hate this for this character or man. Yeah. I really like feel for them. I pity them or whatever yeah. it may be. Um, yeah. and I think that's the unique voice he brings. Um, and I guess just kind of wrapping all of this up, wrapping up this segment yeah. on this kind of Wes Anderson establishing shot overview, you know, um, that kind of brings me to this idea that I was wanting to talk about, um, of just, he creates kind of these scale models of the world, I guess is mm -hmm. a way you could put it. Um, there are these very precise, very detailed little scale models of, of this world. And he drops these flawed characters in them. And, um, you know, um, I, so I guess the best way to explain this is by, um, by contradiction with like another way of doing filmmaking. So like, I feel like a lot of, uh, directors and it, it works a lot of, this works a lot of the time. Um, yeah. but a lot of directors, what they'll do is they'll force you in to mm -hmm. these characters lives. So you, you know, you, they want to push you in, they want to, uh, you know, shove the emotion down your throat. And a lot of times it works, you know, yeah. um, I'll, I'll, I'll finish a movie and I'll look back and I'm like, man, why did I like ball at that movie? Like they <laughs> yeah. were really shoving it down my throat, but it still worked. And, you know, that can work. But I think what is interesting about what Wes Anderson does is he is not, he doesn't shy away from the fact that what I'm creating is artifice. It's something not real. It's something artificial. Um, it's this kind of scale model of the world and I'm putting all these kind of broken pieces in it. Yeah. Um, and, and what we can do is we can hold it. Uh, we can, you know, it's almost like he's giving us, um, in, um, in a, in a essay I wrote, read about, um, kind of his movies is, um, it's like he gives us this little world in a box Yeah. and we can look at it and we can, um, you know, in that essay, he kind of talked about a, a lot of times, kind of holding the world, a child holding the world in his hands, um, can see both like the vastness and detail of it 
and also like its tininess in the universe better yeah. than a man who has circumnavigated the globe. And I thought mm -hmm. that was such a profound, um, uh, just a profound statement of like, sometimes like we just need to be handed the world in a box so that we can hold our emotions and griefs and like, um, uh, you know, feelings kind of like in our hands and look at them and see why, why is the world this way? You know, mm -hmm. um, it's almost as if like what Wes Anderson is doing is like, he, like all of us have this, um, this kind of like longing inside this kind of, uh, deep knowledge that this, the world isn't the way it's supposed to be, you yeah. know, um, this is not how it's supposed to be. And we kind of have, we can kind of like pull these images of like this. I feel like this is the way it's supposed to be. This is the way mm. it's supposed to be. And he kind of builds this like scale model of this world, but all the while knowing like, I, I can kind of pull together some remnants of how I think everything's supposed to be. But at yeah. the end of the day, like it's artificial and I'm going to be dropping these people in it that are real people and yeah. they're going to like destroy it. <laughs> um, but it, but what it does is it lets us like hold it at arm's length and examine it, yeah. um, you know, turn it around, look at like, okay. Um, I see some like, uh, kind of like, uh, pointers or like arrows to like, this is how it should be. And like, these are some things that we've done in this world. Like this is, this is like this depression. This is what this broken relationship has done. Mm -hmm. This is what this has done in this world. You can like hold it out here and look at it and say, man, like, you know, why is that? Yeah. Um, and maybe it doesn't give you any answers, but it gives you a way to, to see it yeah. um, and to feel it and to experience it. Um, that's different than just like shoving you into a scene with, um, with, you know, these melodramatic emotions, you know, right. Um, it's just a very different way of making art um, yeah. in general. Yeah. Um, and I think it's sort of kind of like, it's kind of like a mature children's book because, you know, children's sure. books are, are designed to, to teach you, the good ones, at least to teach children lessons and, and things sure. about the world and things about, you know, friendships, relationships, love and, and things like that. And, and his movies seem to be, you know, we talk about that, that childlike scale or that childlike perspective he has. And it's sort of like that, but like teaching us something um, about the world. I, I think what's so incredible about his movies um, and this has kind of been brought up as, as we've been talking, but he makes fantastical and like, sort of, like I said, like unrealistic movies, but mm -hmm. the characters and, and the things that they go through and things that they sort of experience, like, despite it all being very whimsical, fantastical and stuff, it's also some of the most like real character. Yes. Th some of the most they real characters like that we'll see human. like in film. Yeah. Yes. And, and he For captures sure. that so incredibly well, better than so many other filmmakers that, that try to do it. Um, despite his, like his nature of making films, despite it being so unrealistic, if that makes sense. So it, it is that collision as you would, as you'd said earlier of, uh, you know, doing almost the impossible of making something so unrealistic yet so real and, uh, and touching too at times. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think a part of it is just like, um, you know, it's, he's, man, it's, it's like, it's playing God in a sense. It's like, okay, I'm going to build this like beautiful world and then I'm going <laughs> to drop these, these people in there and see yeah. what happens. Um, and, uh, it's, uh, you know, not, I don't mean playing God in like a bad way. It's, it's more sure. like, uh, in a creative way, you know, you know, I think we all have that quality in us of like creating. Um, yeah. and so like, he's, he's creating these worlds, he's dropping these real people in them, you know, and, you know, let's see what happens. Mm -hmm. Um, 
you know, and like really like I feel like in most of his movies, you don't walk away saying like this is what he wanted me to take away. Um, he doesn't sure. make those sort of movies. He's not really in, I don't think he's really interested in that. No. He's just interested in, um, you know, what happens when we put these people in this world. And and I think there's a degree to which, like, uh, you know, I, I really respect that because he, he's not dumbing things down for his audience. He doesn't need to yeah. tell you what to think about it. He's like, hey, this is something that's real that happens. These are real, real people with real things happening to them. You know, you can take away your, you know, you're a person too. You can relate to <laughs> yeah. it and you can, you can take it away what you need to. And, um, really there's a, a, I think too, like that childlike perspective, um, is a lot too. I think a lot of times, you know, I was talking about this kind of like longing in, uh, in the human heart or soul for, you know, the, the world to be how it was supposed to be or how it should mm -hmm. be um and i think you know i think one of the reasons he makes these like storybook worlds that are from like almost a childlike perspective is because you know a lot of times children have a better vision of that perfect yeah. world than we do we're too like cynical and weathered down um, from our life experience that we like lose vision of this like world as it should, should be. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and children still have that. And so I think that's another element. Um, you know, it, it, children are so innocent. They're, they're experiencing the world. They're taking in, um, things in just a totally different perspective with that's full of wonder um, and I think you see that in a lot of his characters, they have yeah. this, you know, you're like, man, this character is really childlike. Um, and in some ways that's like, it's bad that they're childlike, obviously, yeah. but in other ways it's like, man, but also like they have a perspective that, you know, is good, um, yeah. a kind of hopeful perspective, um, of the way things really should be in our world. And so, yeah. I don't know. That's just something that um, I think is like really cool about Wes Anderson with his, his filmmaking, like techniques and themes that are kind of like a thread that run through it. Not necessarily like specific, but just the general, like what is he doing when yeah. he's making a movie sort of thing? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I think uh, I think what we'll do is um, wrap up uh, this section on Wes. Um, I hope uh, everyone's enjoy kind of listening to us ramble on for so long <laughs> about um, Wes Anderson and uh, who he is, what what he does when he's making a movie. Uh, so yeah, we'll we'll take a quick ba break, and uh, yeah, when we come back. Um, we'll kind of wrap up with some closing uh, segments that I think are going to be really fun. Um, so, yeah, uh, I hope you'll stick around um, to see what we're going to do when we come back. Hey, everyone. Thank you for joining us on The Establishing Shot today. We hope you're enjoying the episode so far, and we hope you'll stick around for the segments we have coming up after this quick break. But uh, during this break, I wanted to tell you how you can get more involved with the Establishing Shot podcast. There are several ways you can do this. The main way you can do it is by going to establishingshotpod.com, our website where you can find all sorts of information like uh, episodes with the show notes on there, uh, information about our guests for each episode. You can find uh, reviews there. Uh, and uh, there's a page where you can actually leave a review on the website if you want to. You can see all the platforms where the podcast is available, like Apple, Spotify, all the major podcast platforms, and even uh, a link to our YouTube page where you can see a video version of the podcast. So uh, please go to the website. And uh, the place I want to highlight there is our donate page, uh, which has information about our Establishing Shot family. This is a way that you can subscribe to the podcast to support all the efforts and uh, the 
just the stuff that goes into making this podcast good and making it better than it even is now. We have different tiers that you can subscribe to uh, starting at $5. And what this will do is you'll be able to support the podcast, help me make it better. And also at the same time, you'll get early and ad free episodes. You'll get access to our discord server where you can join in and just kind of talking about movies with a community that loves uh, film. And so we, we would love to have you in there. Uh, and then the higher up in the tiers you go, the more you get, uh, even things like, uh, chats and video chats that we'll do uh, every once in a while where we get to talk about uh, in more detail stuff that we're talking about on the podcast. So I hope you'll subscribe to that. Uh, Choose a tier that fits uh, your budget. And uh, I would love for you to support the podcast in that way. And uh, the last thing I wanted to talk about uh, is where you can find us on social media. Uh, You can find me personally on Twitter at D. Eli Price. And you can also follow me on Letterboxd. Letterboxd is kind of like a social media for movie reviews. So you can read my reviews there and you can find me there at just Eli Price, you know, no no spaces or anything. Uh, So I'm on Twitter and Letterboxd. You can find the podcast on all the uh, social platforms as well, such as Twitter at eShotPod and then on Facebook and Instagram and TikTok at EstablishingShotPod. So make sure to follow us so you don't miss anything. If you have uh, any questions or comments about the episode or about the podcast, you can always email us at establishingshotpod at gmail.com. And the very last thing I want to do before you get back into the episode today is just ask you to please go to Spotify and Apple and leave some ratings and reviews that really helps the visibility of the podcast and gets it in more people's podcast feeds. And so we hope you will do that for us and we would greatly appreciate it. So I hope you enjoy the rest of the episode and I will see you next time on the Establishing Shot podcast. Hey, everybody. Welcome back uh, to the Establishing Shot. Uh, I'm still here with uh, Jacob. And um, uh, yeah, if you if you are interested in um, other podcasts, uh, Jacob is actually a um, seasoned uh, (laughs) podcaster for what? How many episodes have you all made? Uh, Uh, I think we just football guys. Yeah, the committed football guys were a dynasty. fantasy football podcast. So if that piques your interest at all, go ahead and check us out. I think we've done, we just recorded our ninth or 10th. Um, so pretty excited. Uh, we've been, we've been having a lot of fun with that. So you can check us out on Twitter at, uh, CFG pod. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, me and Jacob are in way too many fantasy football leagues together. So uh, <laughs> that's something else about us. Uh, that's probably pretty informative of, you know, we're football nerds and movie nerds. Yep. So there you go. Um, but yeah, uh, if if you're interested in, uh, in fantasy football at all, um, uh, Jacob and um, a couple other guys that we know um, do a great job with that podcast. So go check that out. The Committed Football Guys podcast um but yeah um yeah i wanted to do uh, a few more uh fun segments uh so we're gonna do some uh movie news uh in a second uh and then uh we're gonna do um a segment that we're gonna do pretty much every week is um a movie draft of some sort or another so we have something fun planned there uh and then we'll close out with uh, just some quick recommendations of the week um and so, yeah, uh, so, uh, movie news, um, man, uh, so at our day of recording, um, we're recording on, um, April 19th. So, uh, you know, some different things might've come out since, uh, we, we recorded when this finally releases. Um, but, uh, man, I have seen so much about this Bo is Afraid movie, yeah, I don't, I don't know what's going on with it. <laughs> it's all over the place. Yeah, I don't, I don't get it either. I don't know if this is like <laughs> marketing is part of it or or what, because it know. seems like from all the quotes from 
Ari Aster and, and just yeah. people who have seen it, it seems so confusing and conflicting. And I, I it feels like marketing to me. Um, yeah. But, but man, there's yeah, like... The, the Ari Aster quotes are for sure marketing. Yeah. The, he's, I wish I would have pulled up some of the quotes, but you can <laughs> just go Google uh, when you get done listening. Go Google like, what has Ari Aster said about Bo is afraid? <laughs> And yeah. you will read the most bizarre things you have ever read <laughs> in your entire life. It's so um, true. <laughs> but yeah, I there's mean, like uh, visceral reactions to uh, yeah. the movie so far in screenings, which Pe is like. Yeah, people are like standing up and like cursing out Ari Aster from, <laughs> you know, from across uh, the country. Yeah. Um, you know, it. it's it's just so bizarre, um, yeah. you know. I don't have anything profound to say about it. I just wanted to ask you and our listeners, like, what is happening? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Um, no, it's a, it's a good question because I have no idea what's happening either, but I'll definitely, it's definitely piqued my interest. Like, I'm definitely, I was right. already excited about it, but now I'm like, all right, I have to see this. So, yeah. Have you seen any of his other films? It, I actually two. haven't. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm not a big horror guy, and that's yeah, kind of yeah. like what he, dwells in mm -hmm. um yeah i've seen hereditary um mm -hmm. it's it's a very good movie um uh i have not seen midsummer midsummer however you say it i've heard yeah. it said in, like several different ways yeah uh i have not seen that yet um i've heard great things i just haven't yeah. seen it um so yeah I, you know i just i don't know what to think about this <laughs> movie if it's if this is all marketing, it's one of the most brilliant marketing campaigns <laughs> maybe since Blair Witch Project. Yeah. Um, so, because I am very intrigued. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, the, the other thing in, in our movie news segment that I wanted to bring up is just like the phenomenon that is the Super Mario Brothers movie. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Have you, have you been able to, you haven't seen it yet, have you? No, I haven't gotten the chance yeah. to see it yet. But everyone I know that's seen it is like really giving it like a, a really solid review. Um, and yeah. so it's definitely one that I I want to see. You know, obviously, like any kid, you know, I loved Super Mario Brothers and and all the games and stuff growing up. So uh, it's definitely one that that I want to get around to seeing, uh, just because it seems like it's a it's a pretty faithful. Um, you know, uh, I I don't know if adaptation is the word since you know sure, yeah. it spans I mean, so yeah. much. But, you know, faithful uh, rendering of, of of these characters that we've, you know, lo loved for so long. Yeah, yeah. I I took, um, it's actually, um, my son has seen like a, a film at a theater before, but it wasn't like a new movie. It was like uh -huh. um, kind of a church group saw like the Grinch and he was like two and he went with us. <laughs> um, and so, it, you know, he's been to the theater before, but this was like his first like um uh, going to the movies yeah. to see a new movie uh experience and man he was excited and um and uh you know i was watching it as someone that grew up playing mario games yeah uh you know i we had a nes um and so like it was um a cartridge that had super mario brothers and duck hunt and some like running game it came with like a i never played that one but uh, i played duck hunt and mario <laughs> Oh yeah, um, classic. All the time. So like I grew up playing these games and so it's it's fun um it's it was fun just seeing them on screen like obviously like the movie itself like is just kind of like there's not a whole lot going on with it. Yeah. Um and so uh you know I went and saw it. my son was so excited. He uh he plays um every once in a while I'll pull up my phone the Mario Kart app and like he'll watch me yeah. do a race um he's four so um you know he he's not like doing it himself or anything but he <laughs> like he's like daddy can we watch a race can i watch you race or whatever and so like yeah. he knows all the characters that's what he knows the mario characters from yeah and so he was just so excited to see uh this movie and like eat some popcorn and uh oh yeah 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 he was man he was excited um uh, we might we might hear from him in a minute. Um, That'd be awesome uh, if I can get him in here and and record uh, his little movie review. Definitely, uh, but we'll have to see how that goes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but yeah, I, I think the 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 thing I wanted to point, uh, bring up though is just like 
man, this is like doing incredible in the box office. Yeah. Um, like I, I have some stats pulled up here. Um, it's the highest grossing debut of 2023 so far. Like it passed Ant-Man and Wasp quantum mania. Um, it's the biggest five day opening of all time. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. So there's there, uh, it opened Easter weekend. So it, it released actually on Wednesday. Um, so there's movies that have like a bigger opening weekend that weren't five day opening weekends. Yeah. Um, obviously. Uh, but yeah, it's the, it's the biggest one that's ever opened as like a five day weekend. Um, and so like it, you know, it's nowhere near like Avengers in game or anything like that. Sure. But those didn't have five day weekends. Right. Um, yeah, it's, um, it's the second biggest debut for an animated movie, uh, above finding Dory and just behind mm. Incredibles two, which yeah. is really incredible. And it's the highest grossing debut for a video game adaptation ever. Yeah. And that's um, one of the things I was pretty happy with that. Like one, it's, it's gotten a lot of really good reviews and, you know, I feel like we've, we've kind of been on a run of like either remakes or different IP coming to the screen for mm -hmm. the first time or for, um, uh, another time. And it's just like been like a flop or it's just not been done well. And so I was, I was happy to yeah. see that like, this is like, cause it's an IP that, that so many people love and adore. And so like for right. them to, to make like an actually good movie with it, um, it's pretty exciting, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's funny because like, if I didn't have the childhood growing up, like playing these games and like having a, a nostalgic connection to the characters, like, honestly, like, it's probably not a good movie, <laughs> but, <laughs> but people are enjoying it because there's so many people that have a connection to these characters. Yeah. Um, you know, and not just like, you know, Gen Xers and, and millennials, but like, the next gen, like they're still making great Mario games. Like everyone yeah. knows Mario and uh, like it's global release is, is just huge. Like internationally, it's even, it's doing even better. It's, it's actually, um, you know, I mentioned that those were the domestic stats. It's actually the second biggest animated opening internationally of all time behind frozen two. Um, and I wow. think it's, uh, I think it might even be projected to, to pass um it i don't know at this point it, it, we might know like did it pass it or not I'm yeah i'm not sure but yeah it, it's projected to hit that one billion mark which is like a big deal um but yeah I, I guess like with all that said like i don't know like how do you feel about because with a, this movie doing this well like we're gonna get some more mario movies yeah like how do you sure. feel about um i don't know just the idea of like these ips getting like doing so well and like kind of like the idea of like making mediocre movies based on ips because they make money like do you have any opinions on that or like do you just like yeah. i don't care like <laughs> like i i know it i like i do and i don't because it's like sure, this yeah. has just kind of been like the wave for Hollywood for a little bit now. Um, but like my, my only hope or, you know, my, what I would like for them to do. And I, I think I've mentioned this to you before, but like if they were able to make, um, cause they are going to make sequels, of course, with this movie mm -hmm. doing as well as it has done, if, if they were to make um, movies like sort of based around some of the games, but also like do it in sort of like a, a Shrek style of like spoofing, um, some of the tropes for whatever. So like, you know, if they did like a Mario Kart movie, they could, you know, make fun of Fast and Furious and they could, yeah, some, yeah. you know, they could figure out a Dr. Mario movie and make fun of like all like the, the hospital drama shows uh, yeah. and stuff. I mean, you've seen. got Luigi, Luigi's Mansion. Yeah, you um, could do stuff. You could do, do so some much. Horror stuff. Yeah. Yeah, they can do some fun stuff with it. Yeah, I'm, I don't know, for a lot of these I'm just kind of like, man, can we just like do something original for once yeah. instead of like all these, because we, you know, we live in, in Lafayette, Louisiana, uh, Jacob and I, and, um, 
what our theaters will not show if they show something like like i remember tar showed and i was like i've got to go this week yeah and go see tar because it, it did it lasted a week in theaters and yeah. then it was gone and they just don't show like those sorts of movies like but yeah. the, i promise you mario brothers movie will be in theaters for like three months yeah here. no for sure um like we don't have an out our house theater to watch some indie films right uh, i remember top gun showed here for i mean i think it showed all of last year like yeah once it hit no, theaters sure. it didn't leave it didn't leave it, no. it didn't leave probably until like maybe february or march <laughs> it was uh, crazy yeah so uh yeah so yeah that's that's really all i have i just wanted to to see if you had any opinions i don't have a strong opinion on it i'm just kind of like at least it's Mario, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I like Mario. Like it's hard to not like Mario. Yeah. Um so um it it and it's you know, at least it's something new, you know. Marvel uh kind of fatigue is a real thing. Oh yeah, um, 100%. Star Wars fatigue is becoming a thing uh for a lot of people including yeah. me and including uh, which well. is terrible to say uh, cuz I yeah. love Star Wars, but um but yeah, it's at the very least, at least at least it's a new IP that's going to start, you know, doing something. Yeah. Um, so we'll maybe we'll get some Mario fatigue in the future. We'll have to see, wait and see. But but yeah, that's all I have for for movie news. Hey, I'm Ezekiel. Hey, Ezekiel. What movie did you see in the theaters with me? Mm, Mario. Mario. That's right. The Super Mario Brothers movie. What was your favorite part of the movie, Ezekiel? Mm, everything. Everything. What about, was there something Bowser did that you liked? Um, I liked him playing the piano. Yeah, you liked him playing the piano, huh? That was fun. What about, did they ride in something that was really fun? I don't think so. No? Mm-mm. You don't remember the Mario Kart part? Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. Who was your favorite car? Um, Toad. Toad, why? Because he was driving a monster truck. That's right, Toad was driving a monster truck. That's funny. Do you think more people should go see the Mario movie? Yes. Do you think they'll like it? Yes. Okay. Thanks, Ezekiel. Say bye. Uh, yeah, we're going to move into um, our movie draft. So just uh, a quick, so like I said, me and Jacob love fantasy football. So we like, uh, you know, doing drafts of players and whatnot. But um, I thought it would be a fun segment to do each week, uh, some sort of movie draft. Um, so, you know, we'll probably do some things like draft some movie years, like we'll go back and forth and pick um, uh, movies from like, I don't know, 1999 and or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll probably put up polls um, on all the socials so that uh, you, the listener, can decide who drafted the best group of movies. Um, but I thought we'd uh, start off with something way more general, like extremely <laughs> general. And we're going to draft movie decades. And so I don't mean like drafting movies from decades. I mean, you're drafting the whole decade. So yeah. if you pick the 2000s, you're drafting all the movies in the 2000s. And so uh, this will be a fun way to kind of get an idea of our tastes um, in movies. We'll maybe highlight like two or three movies from that decade that really make it worth taking. Um, so, Jacob, you're the guest. I'm going to let you start off. What decade are you taking? So... Please don't take the one I want first. I'm going to be so upset. <laughs> Well, I I love uh, many movies from this decade. Um, and again, this is just, you know, I don't know if like, I don't know what's considered like the best movie decade of all time or whatever. But I, I think it's because it's so close to uh, when I was born. I'm going to go ahead and draft the 1990s. Oh, shit. Woof. I'm very relieved. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So highlight love, some of the movies from the nineties. Yeah. So this is like kind of when like the Coen brothers um, who are like probably my favorite directors, like they've put out some amazing movies this uh, 
this decade, you have Fargo, you have the big Lebowski, which are two uh, yeah. phenomenal movies. Um, Shawshank was released in 94 um, reservoir dogs. So the, the start of Tarantino and uh, heat is a recent movie that I recently watched and absolutely blew me away. It's awesome. Uh, and then probably my last one that I'll mention is like Goodfellas, which was 1990 yeah. uh, when it was released. So I, I, there's just a bunch of like really, really fun and good movies and it's coming out of a a decade from the 80s which is just like so weird and zany and this seems like (laughs) a a return to like movie making i guess yeah yeah there's some great uh uh, i have my my letterbox pulled up sorting by yeah my highest rated like 1999 is considered you know one of the best movie years yeah and you have um like i have some five stars in there like the matrix yeah and, um, for sure actually like spoiler alert rushmore uh from the wes anderson series um i love 90s movie the iron giant man such a <laughs> it's just a great animated movie classic but then you have like some stuff like the thin red line um, yeah from malik and uh, pulp fiction seven uh you got you got some of the disney greats like lion king beauty and the yeah. beast uh man, there's some great stuff in here um so yeah uh that's a good that's a good pick and it but it is not the one that i wanted and so i'm so Go happy ahead. to draft the 1970s nice man it's just some incredible films in the 70s yeah um it, of course uh i grew up a huge star wars fan so you have the original star wars um or like a new hope as we know it now sure but you have jaws what i think is spielberg's best movie um you've got uh rocky uh just a great classic stallone um you have uh the original alien Mm -hmm. Uh, just um, alien is just such a good uh thriller um You've got um, some Coppola and Apocalypse Now, Godfather, yeah. Godfather Part Two. Uh, I mean, it's just it, you can go on and on. You've got Taxi Driver from Scorsese. Um, you've got uh, Days of Heaven from uh, Malik, mm-hmm. um, and then like two that I've that I've seen kind of in the last um, year, year and a half um, from um, Tarkovsky, Stalker, and Solaris are two just mm-hmm. like incredibly poetic and like profound films that i that i've grown to love um yeah it's just it's just a fantastic decade in movies i think it might be my favorite movie decade at least like with what i've seen so far sure so that's um we're gonna uh we're gonna i think we're gonna draft uh four decades each so go ahead and make your next pick we might need to speed these up (laughs) yeah i'll go ahead and draft and again probably recency bias, but I love the 2010s. Um, yeah. 2010. It's, it's just got a bunch of, I mean, just absolute studs of movies. Uh, so like in my own personal, like top 10, like La La Land, uh, you have uh Moneyball is one of my favorite movies, Lady mm-hmm. Bird, uh, Mad Max Fury Road. Um, just some like really, really iconic already iconic movies dunkirk um as well on there birdman we mentioned that earlier uh nightcrawler ex machina there's just a bunch of like really really yeah. fun and, and good movies um throughout that that you know and i think part of why i love this decade so much is that this is kind of like right when you know the middle of this decade is when i really started becoming like a real like cinephile and and, and so you right. know a lot of these movies shape um you know kind of how i view uh, cinema and stuff like that yeah that this this would have definitely been my next choice so i'm a little upset i got the 70s <laughs> but this would have been my next choice and it's it's similar it's not it's there probably are some better decades like objectively sure. yeah. um but this was like when i really started growing a passion for movies um and i have some like just all-time favorites in here like uh the tree of life um mm-hmm. it's not for everyone uh <laughs> but man that's it's just when i watched the tree of life i was like i've never seen anything like this before um and so uh but then you know you've got grand budapest from you know Mm -hmm. we're doing our west series uh mad max fury road i mean just an incredible maybe the best action film ever made Um, yeah 
parasite. Um, you know, one of the Academy finally got it right. Examples, <laughs> you know, definitely. Um, Interstellar, which is probably my favorite Chris Nolan movie. Um, yeah, there's some good ones. Um, the Wind Rises is a Miyazaki that I love. Yeah. Uh, Silence by Scorsese, one of my mm-hmm. favorite. Um, yeah, that's a good one. Uh, yeah, I'm going to go next with... This is really hard. I think I'm going to go 80s. Uh, you know, you talked about nice. it being a zany decade, but man, I've got some... I've got some movies that I really like from this decade. Oh yeah. Um, I mean, uh, you, you have a lot of like the, I think the eighties, the blockbusters really started getting going. Um, yeah. but, um, but man, there's some good ones. Like, um, you know, I love my neighbor Totoro. Like I'll, I will put on my neighbor Totoro by Miyazaki and just smile the whole time. <laughs> like there's some sad parts, but like, man, I, it just makes me smile um empire strikes back uh so i get i get the two best star wars movies you know the king of comedy is is one of my favorite scorsese's yeah uh paris texas is um is a movie i feel like a lot of people don't know about uh by uh wim wenders but uh that's an incredible movie uh do the right thing 1989 yeah. spike lee's masterpiece uh you, uh, Raging Bull, another great Scorsese. You get Die Hard. I mean, come on. Yeah. Die Hard. And then even like one of my favorite documentaries um, of all time, the um, the uh, concert film, uh, Stop Making Sense, um, mm. that uh, covers the talking heads, David Byrne. Um, I love that. That that one makes me smile too. If you've never <laughs> seen Stop Making Sense, just go watch it and watch the phenomena that is David Byrne like do magic on a stage yeah but yeah 1980s so i've got the 70s and 80s where are you going next yeah well that was that was gonna be my next pick uh just a couple movies i love from from that era of course raiders uh of the lost ark top gun um talking about two blockbusters you know uh the shining is 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 excellent um the princess bride uh forever underrated but i feel like uh, is, is such a fun movie. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, that's I will, true. I'll go ahead and I'll take like a, even though I haven't seen a lot of movies from this decade, I really respect this decade and I'll go with the sixties. Mm, yeah. Yeah. There, that's there's so choice. many, there's so many just like iconic movies. Um, you know, the first four that are listed on letterboxd for, uh, for the sixties are is 2001 a space odyssey right. psycho dr strange love and rosemary's baby and yeah so like those are four uh the graduates on there as well sound of music lawrence of arabia west side story uh lolita mary poppins fistful of Adol- like yeah. there's just on and on just like these iconic movies that you know it, it, as you get more into movies you just hear about uh, over and over that like these are classics that you have to watch so yeah uh, i'm gonna go and, ahead i mean and pick you've them. even got uh yeah sorry you've even got um i mean those french new wave were yeah. like super influential just to world cinema um you know I, I i've caught up with a lot of 60s movies recently just from yeah. uh film spotting does like a film spotting podcast does a you know a tournament a march madness mm-hmm. kind of tournament with movie decades and they did the sixties this year. And so, um, I caught up with a lot of these, a, a great decade. Um, yeah. So my, uh, my, th- we're on the third, our third choice, right? So my mm-hmm. third decade, um, I, it's probably a similar choice, um, to, to where you went with like, I haven't seen a ton of these, but I respect it is, uh, the fifties. Mm. Um, you know, just some that I've seen that are, that are incredible movies, uh, seven samurai by Kurosawa. And then you got singing in the rain. Gotta love it. Um, 12 angry men is great. Um, you've got some like really good Disney and Cinderella, Alice in Wonderland. Um, a lot of, a lot of really good, um, like musicals, um, funny faces, one that I, that I love with, um, with, uh, Hepburn and Fred Astaire. Um, and, um, but yeah, oh, Godzilla, man, great yeah. movie, Godzilla, uh, the original, but, uh, but yeah, I think, uh, I would pick this decade because there's a lot in this decade that I really want to get to. 
Um, there's yeah. a lot of hit, great Hitchcock in this decade that I, I Hitchcock is a huge blind spot. I've only seen uh, a couple. And, yeah, I'm um, the same way. I, yeah, I, I would love to catch up with with like some Hitchcock and some more Ingmar Bergman, um, some more uh, Kurosawa in the 50s. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of great movies in the 50s that I need to catch up with. So I'll take it, I guess. Yeah. Good What's your last pick? So this one is, uh, you know, we talk about, we talk that we love fantasy football. Eli and I, we both know uh, how you can fall in love with a prospect's potential. Uh, so I'm going to go with the 2020s. Why not? Uh, we're, we're only three <laughs> years in, but we've got some absolute amazing movies like Morbius, uh, Black, I'm yeah. just kidding. Uh, <laughs> no, but there really has been some some really good movies that have come out of this, even though so many movies it seems like are attached to ip but like the new take on the batman you have uh everything everywhere all at once um yeah the banshees of the sharon which i loved um bullet train is a really fun turn your brain off movie if you haven't seen it <laughs> um licorice pizza was really fun uh tick tick boom you got tar like there's already been some some pretty solid movies to to come out of this decade already and then you know july 21st of this year we got barbie we got oppenheimer coming out oh yeah um and so i'm i'm really pumped for 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 those movies especially um and yeah. then one of the biggest movies of all time uh in top gun maverick as well coming out this decade <laughs> that's true yeah you saved know, the so. movies save the movie theaters yeah <laughs> yeah uh yeah, I love the idea of drafting for the potential, you know. There's <laughs> there's some upside there to that draft. Yeah. Um or we can yeah, look I, back and it's just like, oh, it's just all MCU and Mario Brothers movies. <laughs> yeah. It it very well could be. My, man, my last pick, um, I'm struggling, man, because there's three decades I'm looking at and they're they're very much so like I have a few that I really like, but also a yeah. lot to catch up on. Um and I think the biggest thing I'm struggling with is uh, between the 20s and 30s. Here's the mm. reason. I love I love uh, Buster Keaton and Charlie Chaplin movies. I've caught up with a lot of those in the past like couple of years. And, yeah. and I love them. But like a lot of the good Keaton is in the 20s and a lot of the good Chaplin is in the early 30s. And I'm like, I just don't know what to pick. But um I think I'm going to go ahead and just go with the thirties. Um, I'm just it. kind of looking through, uh, I mean, Chaplin, um, you got, uh, modern times and city lights are just like great Chaplin movies. Um, you know, it, it drafting this decade, you get a little bit of versatility between, you know, I've got fifties, seventies, eighties. Um, and you know, you got, movies, movies were pretty trucking by then, but in this, in this era, you're still like, it's still like really close to the dawn of cinema. And so yeah. you have people doing some crazy stuff. You've still got silent films um, and that slapstick from Chaplin, but you're also like starting to get like the wizard of Oz and, mm -hmm. uh, and movies like M you've got like the monster movies, um, which like I yeah. caught up with Frankenstein last year. Frankenstein is just, it's so good. Um, but you've yeah. also got like John Ford coming on the scene with stagecoach and, uh, and stuff like that. So yeah, I'll, I'll take, Oh yeah. Top hat. Great movie. It's just yeah. top hat is so fun. Fred Astaire, Ginger Rogers, uh, great movie. Um, so yeah, I'll take the thirties for my last one. Uh, nice, so yeah, nice. I'm pretty happy. Yeah. So I, I ended with, um, the seventies, the eighties, the fifties and the thirties. Um, what, what did you end up with Jacob? I ended up with, uh, the nineties, uh, the 2010s, the 60s, and the 20s, the 2020s, yeah. <laughs> the 2020s, the the, year, the decade of potential, the roaring yeah, so. 20s. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so yeah, we'll we'll probably put a poll out um, on all the socials um, uh, after the episode releases, so that you can all vote on who has the best four decades, uh, me or Jacob. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, you know, feel free to let us know too, um, some, some that we left out that you think was just an atrocity. Uh, maybe you just love the twenties or forties or, you know, we didn't draft the two thousands. Yeah. We didn't uh, draft maybe. the two thousands. Yeah. So, so maybe you think the two thousands is, um, 
it's just an atrocity that we left that out but um <laughs> yeah uh let us know um this that was really fun um i look forward to doing some fun uh different sorts of movie drafts in the future uh but yeah uh we're gonna close out with some very quick uh recommendations of the week um i think uh I, um, I'm going to hold this up. If you're listening to the podcast, you're not going to be able to see it, but, um, Jacob actually looked at it earlier today. We were together. Oh, yeah. Um, this, uh, it's easy for me to pick my recommendation for this week because, um, we're starting the Wes Anderson series and, um, I picked up this Wes Anderson collection, um, book from Matt Zoller sites. Um, and um he's um he's a good friend of wes anderson and he mm-hmm. compiled this book this one um covers bottle rocket through moonrise kingdom um and it's really cool it has a ton of just like shots and frames and storyboards and fun yeah. stuff to look at in it but also it ha- each uh for each movie he has um an essay and then a long interview with wes anderson so yeah. you really get some insight into his movies so um he has this one. This one covers those movies that I said, but he also um, he's been coming out with one as new movies released. So there's one for Grand Budapest. There's one for Isle of Dogs. Uh, there's one that I think is releasing later this year for French Dispatch. Um, so, yeah, really cool, um, really cool book. Um, I guess that's my recommendation of the week as we start off this Wes Anderson series. What yeah, do you got, Jacob? Sure. It can be anything. I, I recommended a book. Maybe you want to recommend a good meal you had. Uh, you know, it can whatever you want to recommend. Uh, what you got? So mine's going to be sort of uh, an activity, I guess. Um, okay. So I've been in the gym a little bit more recently, and there's something that you know most people should do, which is cardio. I absolutely hate cardio personally. And so the way that I've been able to get through my cardio is I will, uh, you know, I have some of the streaming services that I'm subscribed to on on my phone and I'll just throw on a movie and, uh, and get through, you know, 10, 15 minutes on the Stairmaster, get a, get a good walk in on the treadmill. Uh, and so I've been able, I've been able to watch a bunch of movies recently just through, uh, doing cardio at the gym. So I highly recommend it if you are like me and you hate cardio uh, obviously, if you're if you're running outside and stuff like that, it's kind of hard to do to to run. Yeah, and don't your phone. don't run don't run and watch. Yeah, yeah, I would I would uh, I would agree. Don't do that. But if you are doing your your cardio in the gym, highly recommend uh, watching movies while you do it. Okay. Now, are you watching new movies that you've never seen before? Or yeah, are you watching I'm, like I'm, old movies that you like. Uh, there's kind of a mix. I, I haven't been watching like movies where like, okay, I need to sit down and watch this and like pay attention sure. to Sure. Okay. But like I got through like uh the old Rocky movies. I I'd never seen them before. Okay. Um, so yeah. I watched some of that and then uh some other like I, I just recently finished Speed, um Keanu Reeves, gotcha. Sandra Bullock, some yeah. action there. Um so so kind of movies like that. Yeah, not not like the uh not like the the movies that I, I'm like, oh, I really need to like sit down and, and watch with like a notebook. Yeah. Yeah, that's um, that's great. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. As we close out, um, Jacob, uh, if you why don't you let us know um, where we can find you on uh, on social media um, and um, and maybe anything else you wanted to plug real quick uh, before we end the show. Yeah, you can uh, you can find me on Twitter uh, at Philly Tweetin. Uh, so that's tweeting, but without the G, uh, yeah. P H I L L Y T W E E T I N. Uh, and you can follow uh, our uh, our podcast, the Committed Football Guys podcast, on there as well uh, at CFG Pod. Uh, we're pretty uh, we're both pretty active on there um, as far as uh, with fantasy football content. But I'll probably get probably going to be doing some more movie. Uh, content as, as well with more updates and uh, movies like, you know, I mentioned Barbie Oppenheimer and then Bo's afraid coming out. Um, yeah. So yeah, you can find me on there and, and you can find uh, if you're interested in some dynasty fantasy football talk. Um, yeah. yeah. Check out our podcast. And you're on letterbox too. Um, letterbox yes. is a, is a great um, app for kind of, it's like a movie social media. It's great. Yeah. You can have a diary, log your movies, um, write reviews, read other people's reviews. Yeah, so you can Make find me on there. Yeah, I do. I do all of that. Um, I like to log my movies um, and and write either a full review or or sometimes if the movie's just too good, I'll just write like a one sentence sort of thing. 
Um, but or one word about I just saw you wrote sheesh for heat. Yeah, you watched heat, yeah, heat, and your your reaction, your review was sheesh. Yeah, it was it was it was that. <laughs> like if you watch it, you'll understand. Uh, yeah. So yeah, it's Cinephil. Uh, so my last name Phillips. Uh, my nickname is is Philly. Uh, so yeah, C I N E P H I L L Cinephil on Letterboxd. Awesome. Well, uh, it's been great having you on. And uh, spoiler alert, um, Jacob will be joining us for episode two when we cover Bottle Rocket. So you can look forward to hearing uh, his voice again. But uh, we have gone on for way too long. Um, (laughs) I didn't envision this podcast being this long, but I really think um, we had some great content. It was good to do a big overview of Wes Anderson. Yeah, um, he deserves it. And uh, and have a little fun after the fact. So I had some fun drafting those movie decades. So uh, we are going to leave you here, and I hope you enjoyed the show. Um, And we will see you next week for a Bottle Rocket. Thank you so much for joining us on The Establishing Shot today. We hope you enjoyed the episode and got a lot out of it. Make sure before you go to like and subscribe uh, on all your podcast platforms, and especially on Spotify and Apple. If you could leave a rating and review, that would greatly help the visibility of the podcast, and I would greatly appreciate it. Again, if you go to establishingshotpod.com, you can find out all you need to know about the show, where to find us on the social media platforms, where to find us podcast wise, YouTube, uh, and you can even leave a voicemail there on the website on the right side of your screen. So click that if you want to give a comment or ask a question about the show, uh, just feel free to leave a voicemail. We'd be happy to feature that on the show. And also, if you just want to email rather than leave a voicemail, you can email us at establishingshotpod at gmail.com. And we would be happy to answer your question there or feature a question or comment on the show if it pertains to uh, the episodes. So please do that. And we would love for you to join the Establishing Shot family. You can, again, find where to do that on the donate page at establishingshotpod.com. We hope you have a great week and we look forward to seeing you again next time. We were happy here for a little while. But look, I figure it this way. Better to be king for a night than schmuck for a lifetime.